Welcome to First Pres, Mom, Me. We are so glad you're gathering with us for worship this morning. If you're a guest, we're especially glad that you're here and hope that you've already been welcomed well as you've made your way into the sanctuary. Um, welcome to those of you joining us online. We're grateful for your presence with us here as well. Uh, if you are a guest, whether here in the sanctuary or online, we would love uh, to get to know you better and would ask your help in doing that. Here in the sanctuary, you'll find Connect With Us cards. Our hope is that you might complete that, put it in the offering plate on your way out this morning so that we can reach out and say hello. If you're online, send us an email. Um, uh, at, uh, you'll find our address at the website, and we'll look forward to getting to know you that way as well. Before we come more fully into worship, just a a couple of cues uh, about worship this morning and an announcement about our life 
as the church, you'll recognize that the communion table is set this morning. And that's always a special thing. Uh, when we are able to share the sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, we take hold of the promise that God uh, wants to encounter us both in the Word and in the sacrament. And so as we worship this morning, uh, do so with special intention to prepare yourself to come uh, to the table. I'm grateful uh, Landon Rohr, our Director of Student Ministries, will be preaching this morning. And, uh, and so pray for him as we uh, worship early on as well. Uh, and then remember, uh, the newsletter shares all about the life of the church, and one of the reminders in there is about the, the current collection for the Pregnancy Center of Greater Toledo. As we anticipate the Super Bowl and all that we will share that benefits ourselves, we want to we want to share with those in need, and so uh, go and look at details related to that collection, and uh, let's together uh, seek to bless those in need in our city. With that, can I invite you to stand, and I will pray, and we will continue in worship together. Oh, Lord Jesus, uh, we do indeed come together to praise your name. We recognize you are the King of Heaven. And you are bringing your kingdom into this world. We are citizens of your kingdom, even as we live in this world. And so would you help us in this time of worship to align ourselves with you again. Fill us by your spirit, by your body, by your blood, by your word. Fill us in every way with your very self so that as we leave this place, we might leave as faithful ambassadors of your kingdom going out into this world in which we live. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.
we come now to a time of confession, and I want to set this up a little bit differently. Um, I was listening recently to an interview where they were discussing mental health and the church. You know that uh, 60% of people within America uh, have some mental health concerns, it is said, and, and that figure holds true within the church as well. And the interviewer lamented that you don't hear about mental health very much in the church. And I think that's true, except when we come to this time of confession. For I want us to recognize anew what we are doing as we confess sin. When we confess sin, we are, yes, remembering those things that we knew we should not do but did anyways and asking for forgiveness. That is true. But confession of sin is so much more than that. Confession of sin is the recognition that that because of sin, our world is broken. The systems are broken. Our body is broken. Our mind is broken. And it, it invites us to come and admit that to our Lord and ask for help. If 60% of us are really wrestling with mental health concerns, well, this is a moment for you to acknowledge that reality, not in shame or guilt, but in the hope of the cross, and to ask Jesus for help. And so let's, let's do that together, as we always do. Uh, I will start a prayer and invite you to, to voice it with me, and then during a moment of silence, We can confess the brokenness of our life and our sin to God once again, taking hold of his restoration and righteousness. After we pray, just one more cue, after we pray, but before we remind ourselves of the forgiveness that was won for us at the cross, we will continue to lament in song, singing the song, Lord, from sorrow's deep I call. So let's share this time together. Lord, we cry to you to heal our wounds. We call to you in distress and plead for your salvation. We have sinned against your law and failed to do your will. We confess that we've disobeyed your holy word. We pray purge our lives of selfishness and our hearts of bitterness lead us back to righteousness save us through Jesus Christ let's pray quietly
now hear the promise of God's holy word that if we confess our sin both what we've done what we've left undone the brokenness in the world around us and within us if we confess our sin he who is faithful and just stands ready to forgive us of that sin and free us from all unrighteousness, that is, setting things right in our life and world again. You have peace with God based on that promise. And so you are called to be at peace with one another. Let's take a moment to share a sign of Christ's peace with each other. moment always blesses me as I think about the call to pass along the faith to these uh, little ones God has entrusted to us, but make no mistake, that song is for us as well, that God would prepare our hearts to hear His Word. I was just uh, uh, captivated by Hope Corbett there, whose eyes, I don't know if you noticed Landon, her eyes were fixed on the cross that whole time as she sung. Uh, May the eyes of our heart uh, be fixed on Jesus as we read his word this morning. Uh, I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 7, verses 27 through 24 through 27. I invite you to, to turn there now. As you do, allow me to just offer some cues. Most of you are aware we are working our way through the through the scripture, tracing God's story from beginning in Genesis until the formation of the church, there is a uh, calendar or schedule for those readings, and I know many of you are following that, not only Sunday to Sunday, but daily. You'll notice this morning we are not taking the full suggested reading um, as Landon preaches, but only the very, very end of it. Um, I think that's right as the end is critically important, and we want to focus on that, but want to make sure that, that you are aware uh, of that change. Before I read, allow me to, to pray that God's Spirit would help us to encounter God in the Word. Well, Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you have given us this very special revelation about who you are and who you call us to be. We come to your Word both as it's read and as Landon preaches it, believing uh, that very thing, that this is more than a mere book that will tell us about something that happened long ago, but that in your divine mystery, you encounter us in a very personal, very relational way through the words of this text as they are offered by your Spirit, if indeed we are open. Uh, to hearing from you. And so, Lord, uh, would you open our hearts and minds to your word and your spirit this morning. I pray for Landon especially, that uh, he would be strengthened by your spirit to speak with power 
and clarity, both the grace and the truth of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Again, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. These are the words of Jesus. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not as their own, as their teachers of the law. Clint said um, this is a very short passage and there's a lot in it, but there's also beauty in the simplicity of it. So I thought, because it's short, we'd maybe take a second and do something fun to bring the scripture to life. Uh, so Trav, would you come up here and help me real quick? If those of you that don't know anything about me, I really enjoy lifting weights, and I have the privilege of doing some strength training at Mommy High School, and I run some programs and things. And part of what I've learned is that if a kid listens to you when you coach them, they get better. And if they don't listen to you and they do their own thing, they normally don't get better. So this is just, you're probably going to get it wrong. That's okay. That's the point. There's a, there's a kettlebell right there. Will you grab it? This is a 10-pound kettlebell. It's a really useful tool for training a lot of really fun things. And Trav, I just want you to show everybody how you would train your traps with a kettlebell. Yeah, train your traps. You just do something. Train your traps. Okay, that's your bicep. Try something different. He did a curl. That's a bicep. Train your traps. You do a squat, try a squat. That's not your traps. Okay, no. Someone said something and you're like, I don't know. You're like, I don't know. Yeah, do that. Now keep your shoulders back. And go, I don't know. I'll put it down. And pick your shoulders up and go, I don't know. And put it down. These are your traps. Keep going. Keep going. We're going to get Trav a huge neck and give him that wrestler build. All right, great. Thanks. Trav, you can sit down. But you all give Travis an applause. I just thought that'd be fun. I picked traps because I was really hoping Travis wouldn't know what traps are, uh, and I lucked out. Um, the point of this is, is, is really simple, is that I wanted Travis to demonstrate that we don't always know what we want to do. Um, and if Travis's goal was to get stronger, and if Travis's goal was to be his own, if, it was, if he was his own coach, he might not have gotten stronger because he might have trained the wrong things, and if he wasn't careful, he could even have hurt himself. He could have used the, the dumbbell in the wrong way, or he could use the wrong amount of weight, something you know, silly like that. But that's true of all of us in our own lives. When we do things our way, when we trust ourselves a little bit too much, when we put ourselves in control, we don't always achieve the goals we want. Sometimes we achieve bad goals, and if we're not careful, we achieve goals that hurt ourselves or hurt those around us. And this is the point we see Jesus trying to make in the parable of the wise and foolish builder. Um, he tells us that we can live our life according to our will and maybe get it wrong, or we can live our life according to his will and build something that lasts and that is strong and that matters. So if you'll pray with me for just a second, we can jump into this short but deep parable. Lord, I thank you that you teach us simply, that in four short verses you've packed so much wealth of knowledge I pray that you would give us ears to hear it and hearts to receive it, uh, and that you would make the scripture come to life for all of us. It's in your son's name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so we could just, had Clint already read the scripture, I think you all get the main point, so if we close the Bible right now, you would walk away and have learned something. So I'm good. So we're, we're good. Uh, but I want to look at this real, real quickly before we try to bring it to life. 
there's a couple of real important things we should notice as we read this parable. In the very beginning of verse 24, Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words, and the question then is what words? What words are he talking about? What words is he talking about? He's talking about everything preceding this, beginning in Matthew 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has taught a tremendous amount of information over the past few hours, probably, to a crowd of over 10,000, many people suspect. He's talked about the Beatitudes, which are all these ways of being that are very hard for us to be. He's talked about giving to the poor. He's talked about how to pray, which is what we talked about last week. He's talked about turning the other cheek and not storing up treasures and not being anxious and not judging. And as you, if you go back and you reread the Sermon on the Mount, you'll be, it's not an easy life to live. We're called to a very high life. At one point, we'll talk about later, Jesus calls us to be perfect. And we're not. But those are the words he's talking about. Saying anyone who has heard this tremendous sermon I've given, and I'm sure he was that egotistical about it, um, he's telling us this because he knows, as well as we, we do, that living the life that he's he's lived and living the life he's called us to in the Sermon on the Mount goes against our very nature. By nature, we typically want the easiest thing or we want the most pleasurable thing or we want the thing that's best for us and the Sermon on the Mount has turned all of that upside down. He wants us to live a life that almost feels foreign to our nature. So those are the words he's talking about and then he he goes on, he says, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice So, puts them into practice. People have to put things into practice. So, who are the people? The people is the crowd. And if you're in a crowd and you're being called to put something into practice, it's a call to action. Jesus is asking these people in the crowd to do something. But we're not in the crowd, and we're reading the sermon. So, it's also very much, we are the people he's calling to action. We're we're not in the crowd, but we've read the words. We've heard the words. We come to church every Sunday and we hear these words. We have a blessing in that while we don't have Christ with us, we have the Holy Spirit in us and we have the privilege of carrying around God's word with us at all times and we can read it. Many of the people in this crowd probably could not have read the scriptures at the time Jesus gave this sermon. We have so much. We have the playbook right in front of us if we're going to stick with the coaching analogy. And when Jesus is giving this call to action, I have to think, it's kind of like when I, I leaned behind Travis and whispered to him, it's like giving a coaching point. This is Jesus going, hey, what I'm about to say really matters. You need to do this. So the whole crowd has to be on edge. They've been listening to Jesus teach. They've been listening to him say all these crazy things that sound wonderful but sound very difficult. And he's going, here's, here's the big takeaway. This is a warning. You've heard all of this. You've heard the words. You know what they mean. I'm talking to you. You need to hear about these builders. And what's most striking about this passage is that what the builders build isn't different and how skilled they are isn't different. It's where they build. Where they build is what matters. So both these builders might have been masterful builders. They could build a house that from the outside looked gorgeous and from the inside looked beautiful. It's the kind of place you want to go and hang out and watch the Super Bowl. You might want to be there. But when you start looking at things, if you're a builder, you might notice that one house is up to code because he's followed the blueprint Jesus has given him. He's built a house on a firm foundation. And the other builder has built a house that looks great, but it isn't up to code. The sink, like the drain for the sink is too close to the wall. And you don't know why that matters, but it looks off. And the studs are maybe a foot too wide apart. And you can't see the studs. But when the storm comes, it's going to matter. And he used a size 8 screw instead of using a size 10 screw. And there's all these little things that you can't see. But his house looks beautiful. He's just done it differently. But ultimately, the biggest difference isn't what they've built. It's not how it appears. It's where they've built. One builder has built on, a, on the rock, on the bedrock. There's nothing deeper than this. You can't go lower. The bedrock's not going to give out. This foundation is going to stand and last no matter what happens. And the other builder has built his house on the sand. And if you were in the audience, the word Jesus uses for sand is a word that relates to this thing called a wadi. And a wadi is a dried up riverbed. 
And geographically, where Jesus is giving this sermon is a place around him. He's on the mount, and around the mount are dried up riverbeds. This is a place prone to flooding. So if Jesus said one guy built his house on a safe foundation and one guy built his house in a riverbed that's going to flood in six months, you can see how foolish that is. It's not just, oh, he didn't build it on a stone. He he built it in a place that everyone knew this was going to be a bad idea. (laughs) It's like showing up to work out in high heels. If you do that, one, I want to see it. That's crazy. Two, and you don't hurt your ankle or you don't tweak something or pull something, like that's... (laughs) That's amazing. The Lord has blessed you. You need to get that and get famous. Keep doing it. Um, but you can see how foolish this really is. It's not just, oh, it's not a good foundation. It's a, this is a bad foundation. And so we see Jesus has made a really clear point. If you listen to me and you build your life on the foundation I've given you, you will survive the storms. And if you don't listen to me and you build your house on something else, the storms, not only will they come, but they will destroy what you've built. Your house will fall down with a great crash, is how this uh, parable ends. So, now we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean for our life? As we keep talking about this verse, I'm going to talk about the house and the builder, and I want you to know that both of those are metaphors for us. The builder is us and the life that we're building, because we're all building something, and the house is the life we've built. So it's, the, it's what you can look back on and go, I've done this. So if you're young, you might be going, well, what have I built? My house is really small. It's, well, you're a great builder, but you have a small house because you're young. You haven't built a tremendous mansion yet. If you're older, you might feel like you're not building a lot anymore, but you have a beautiful house to look back on. So depending on what stage of life you're in, I think these two different metaphors will hit you differently, but know that both apply to us. Um, but this is, the, this is the story. And I think there's a fun way to show this, too. Um, how many people have tried to do DIY in their house? It, it, sometimes it goes okay, sometimes it doesn't. Um, DIY stands for do-it-yourself, and sometimes you can DIY something very nice. My dad is very skilled at building, and so I want to show you a photo of a guitar pedal board my dad is building me. He, took, he found the wood, he sanded it, it's flat, it's plain, he's putting it together, he's gluing it together. There's tools that I don't know what he's using for. You can tell my dad is a skilled builder. And when you, when you DIY that, you're going to be proud that you built it and saved money, if you saved money. Sometimes it ends up costing more. And then there's DIY, why did you do that? Like, and that's what these two photos represent. Like, DIY, are there classroom lights in that kitchen lamp and DIY are we putting giant I don't know what like that's I'm hoping electrical but it looks like plumbing and they're next to each other and that's not good this is the difference is that um, what you expect from this parable is that one guy's building a house like this and the other builder is building a house like the pedal board I just like dad built but in reality both houses look nice the difference is where they build and that's that's the, that's the important part. Because the outcome is what Jesus leaves us with. The outcomes of the two houses are what's different. The people who build their lives on a foundation of Christ, the builder who obeys the words of Christ and puts them into practice, are building their life on a foundation that will outlast the storm. And the people who don't are building their life on a foundation that will shift and break and their house will get swept away. We have to think about what that means for us. If you are building your life on a foundation that lasts, other than the fact that you have a house, like why is that important? I would say the most important reason is that our foundation and our surviving the storm is part of our witness. When the storms come in your life and you can endure them, people will see that. I don't know how many of you have experienced great trauma I'm relatively young, so I haven't experienced deep, painful trauma for the most part. But like one day, someone I know and love dearly will pass. That will be a storm in my life. Some of us have experienced uh, divorce, whether it's ourselves or those close to us. Some of us have experienced physical sickness that has left us debilitated or changed. Some of us have experienced mental illness that's done the same. Um, Some of us have experienced the death of a child. 
those are storms. And they will shake you to your foundation, to your core. And if what you've built on cannot sustain you, you will lose everything. That's, that's what Jesus is getting at. I have a friend named Ben Bonham. Uh, ben is a father of four, and he's recently adopted three children that are relatives of his. And he, he's wise beyond his years. And I'll never forget one time Ben told me a story about his grandmother. Ben's grandmother lost her husband. And Ben asked his grandma, like, Grandma, why aren't you upset? Why aren't you crying? Why aren't you in tears? And her response was, I thought it was profound. She said, the Lord gave me 50 years with your grandfather, and I enjoyed every one, like, every second of it. And now your grandpa is with the father, and I'll get to see him again. This was a woman whose foundation was built on Christ. In the, in the face of death, she thanked the Lord for what she had gotten because she knew that her husband wasn't hers. He belonged to the Father. And her foundation was rock solid. Like, there's a reason we say these things, right? Like, the Bible has worked its way up into our modern language. It's amazing. But I could imagine just as well how her husband could have passed and if her life was predicated on him and what he had done for her and built for her and provided for her and all of a sudden he's gone she would have been a wreck and in desperate need of help and saving. When we can survive those storms and people see them, people will ask us how we survive those storms, how we face death with joy, how we're facing a terminal illness without fear and anxiety. And whether we say the name of Jesus or not, it'll be a witness to the people around us that we know the Father. And it might be an opportunity for you to share your faith. It's amazing. The other amazing thing that I think we have to consider is that Christ suffered in his life. Christ was persecuted and tormented and ultimately died a death on the cross that was meant for us. And scripture tells us to to count it all joy when we suffer for the glory of Jesus. When those storms come and they beat, and when when the water rises and the winds beat against our house, we might have some damage. We might have to go outside and replace a window put some new shutters up, maybe replace some roofing. But we can count that joy because in our suffering, we, we are living like Christ. We're knowing the suffering that Christ knew. And that will help us to be more like him and know him. Christ did not live an easy life, and nor did we, but both of us can go through trials and temptations and suffering and survive because our bedrock is the Father and not the world. So, I even think, like, Jesus, right before he went to the garden, what did he, what did he do in the garden? He, he prayed. He said, Father, not my will be done, but yours. He, he did not want to go through the suffering the same way we don't want to go through the suffering. He, doesn't want to, he didn't want to have the storm the same way we don't want to have a storm. But he was prepared. And if we have Christ as our, as our bedrock of our faith, we too can be prepared. What, this is a... It's, just, it's simple. It's so simple that it's hard to say, right? Like Christ is telling us the storms will come. Be prepared. Build your life on a strong foundation and do what I did. It's an invitation to be more like Christ. So that leaves us with a really interesting question that requires some self-reflection is what is your foundation? Um, I got to talk with some people during the pastor's Bible study and there were a lot of really interesting answers to this question and I want to share three of them with you. I think many people, especially in America, we build our foundation on money. We say something like, we might not say it, but we feel it. We go, if I have enough money, I can protect my house. And if I can't protect it, I can fly somewhere else. And if I can fly back, I can build a new house. It doesn't matter if my house gets destroyed in the flood. I'll just build another one. It's a really easy trap to fall into because money feels like we have power and it feels like you have security and it feels like you have safety. But money can't replace priceless things. There are things in your home, there are things in your life that can't be replaced. Think about the memories that are the core of who you are. You know, the, the day you said I do to your spouse or the day your firstborn child was born or the day that you graduated high school or the day that you know, those those core memories that you look back on with nothing but joy, and you experience the storm of forgetfulness. 
and now you can't remember those moments, and then eventually you can't remember the faces of the people you love. No amount of money can fix that. And Jesus tells us that in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, 24, just a chapter ago, he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. If your heart is chasing after money, even if it's for good things, your heart's chasing after the wrong thing, and your foundation will come to an end eventually. This is, uh, the next one is practicality. Maybe you're building your house on a foundation of practicality. This is something I'm very prone to. If I have the perfect plan, I can be prepared and unharmed when the storm comes. I can build sandbags up around my house in all the right places at the right angles. I can build my house on a tall enough foundation that the water will just go around it. I can build my house in the right spot on a hill. We have great plans. The problem is, is that sometimes our plans don't work. We've all experienced that. We have great plans that don't work. And we can't plan for everything. You can't explain and prepare for the unexpected, deep, mysterious pains that come in our life. Like death. You won't be prepared for it. Or being lied to by a trusted friend. Or if all of a sudden your job is no longer available to you because the company went under, because someone well above you took a risk that did not pan out. You can't prepare for that. Your plan won't work. And Jesus tells us so. Again, just a chapter earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? No amount of preparing for the storm will ever add anything to your life. If nothing else, it'll just steal those hours away from your life. We're meant to live a life enjoying, the lo- enjoying what the Lord has given us. And if we spend our whole life holding on to fiercely and protecting and preparing for bad things to happen, that's not the life we're called to live. The last one, again, I think this is a really easy trap to fall into, is we build our life on a foundation of being a good person. We say something like, if I'm a good person, there won't be storms in my life. The Lord will bless me. But we all know that bad things happen to good people all the time. And who of us is that good? And how do we know what is good? Right now in the world, there are so many people saying what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad, and there's this polarity. I don't know where you fall on the spectrums, but there are things people want taught in school and not taught in school. There are issues we talk about with gender and identity, and there are folks that do not want to talk about gender and identity. There are folks who love the word and scripture and Jesus, and there are folks who think that church is evil. You can fall anywhere you want in any of those spectrums, but your good is always going to be someone else's bad. So how do you know what good even is? And I mentioned this earlier, but Christ tells us that our good will never be good enough. In Matthew 5, so again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you, greet, or if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If we're going to be good enough, we have to be perfect, and none of us are perfect. There's hundreds of foundations you could build your life upon. Family, relationships. If you're a student, it might be school and good grades and being popular. If you're a spouse, it could be being a good spouse. If you're in business, it might be success. If you're a doctor, it might be helping people. There are so many things you could build your life on. But if it's anything other than Christ, a storm will come, and the life you've built will come crashing down. Jesus is unapologetic about that. So I would like to leave you with two ideas. Why should you build your life on the foundation of Christ other than the fact that he explicitly tells us to? That's a pretty good reason. I'll give you two. We should build our life on the foundation of Christ because we know it's a good foundation. If this foundation was good enough for Christ, it must be good enough for us. The second is that it is the only way we'll weather the storms in life. And in our weathering of those storms, we will serve as witnesses to Christ to all of those around us. It's hard to get up and talk to our friends and our family about Christ and our faith. This is one of the ways that you don't have to do that. 
If your life is built on Christ, people will notice because you're building your foundation somewhere else. While the world is building over here, you're building over here. And when the storms come and these houses get flooded and destroyed and we are safe, people will notice and ask why. And you can reach out and walk over and help everyone who has suffered the flood. I'd like to give you one story too to close, um, all three of the foundations, money, practicality, and being a good person. In my life right now, I'm tempted by all three of these to build my life on these things. My, Alyssa, my wife and I are talking about starting a family and buying a house and making plans for the future, and it's a wonderful, exciting, terrifying time. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, if I can make a little bit more money, I can be a good spouse and provide financial security to my family. That's a good thing. And I told Alyssa as we were planning, what's a timeline look like? Can I just have a checklist of a couple things to make sure, like, hey, we're ready. I have, we have enough money or we have enough savings or we have the right-sized house. And there's never going to be a checklist, but I wanted that. And all this is wrapped up in, if I'm a good enough person, this will work out. If I love Alyssa and I prepare, if I know who I love, I can make the right sacrifices at the right time. So I'm thinking, if I, if I do this, I'll be good. And then I'm thinking, if I do this, I'll be good. And then I'm thinking, if I do this, I'll be good. And it wasn't until Alyssa said, if it's the, Lord will, if it's the Lord's will, it'll be good. I have faith in the Father. That I realized my foundation's on all the wrong things. I need to build my life on Christ and Christ alone. So as you go home, I would challenge you to reflect on what are you building your foundation on? Is it Christ? If not, it's not too late to turn around and build something different. But with that, I'll pray for us and the worship team will come back up. Lord, you are so good to us. You've given us your word time and again. You've made it knowable and teachable to us and I thank you that you've given us hearts to receive it. I ask that you would help us to reflect and to look inside and to truly ask ourselves, what are we building our lives on? Are we building our lives on things that will not last? Or are we building our lives on you? Will we be prepared when the storms come? Because you tell us that when we trust in you and have faith in you and obey your words, that we will be prepared and that our foundation will not be shaken. Lord, I pray that the lives we are building serve as witnesses to those around us and that you would use us to carry out your will and that the lives we live would bring you glory and honor. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and it's in your Christ, it's in your Son's name, Jesus, we pray, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Landon. Kids, you can come on in and find your parents <clears throat> as we prepare to come to the table together. You know, as Landon was preaching, I was just struck by what a master Jesus was with imagery to help us truly understand what's important, to picture our life like building a house, asking us, uh, what foundation are you building on? This table gives us another set of images. Truly, uh, in the, this picture, juice that we remember is the, the blood of Jesus himself. You know, this coming week, uh, we will host a, a blood drive downstairs, and many will come from the community, and they will give blood, and that blood will be sent off, and it will literally provide life to those who are going through a storm. As we come to the table, we have that same imagery in mind, that, that it is the blood of Jesus, the very life of Jesus that infuses us with, with His life, so that, like Landon was saying, when the storm comes, we stand, not because of our own ingenuity, our own strength, our own wisdom, but because the very presence of Jesus is within us. And so, let's prepare uh, to be filled with the body and the blood of Jesus together. Could those who are going to help serve the congregation please come forward? As you do, let me remind you how, how we're going to go about this. Uh, after the words of institution, um, I will invite all of you to come forward at the table. And so, you ought to, uh, in your own time, make your way to the, to the center aisle here, kind of make two rows. Pastor Jason and I will indicate to you that you should take for yourself the bread 
and the cup. As you do that, go back to your seat by the outward aisle and receive the elements whenever you are ready. I encourage you to spend some time in, in prayer and uh, take that very, very seriously. Um, as most of you are getting up and coming down the center aisle, uh, Charlie and Beth Sheets will be waiting, uh, one on each side, looking for those who are not getting up um, and uh, bringing the elements to you so that you can take uh, communion right where you are. And so if you have any concern about walking or coming forward, please rest assured, just stay where you are and the sheets will bring you uh, the body and the blood of our Lord. Let me pray as we come together to this table. Oh Lord Jesus, we give thanks. We give thanks for your presence in our midst. We give thanks for the word preached. We give thanks for the call as we are building this life you've given us to not be fooled into thinking we can build on anything else but you. For if we do, when the storm comes, and it will come, Lord, that house will crash. But we come to this table believing that a life built on you, that a life infused with your presence through the body and the blood, Lord, will last for eternity. And so, Lord, would you fill us up by your very self and enable us to go from this table into the world, proclaiming your goodness and your love to all around. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you, when you eat it, do so remembering me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he poured it, and he said, this is the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins when you drink it. Do so remembering me. And in taking the bread and taking the cup, he reminded those with whom he gathered on that first night, and we're reminded still that this sacrament is a proclamation, uh, an invisible reality made visible in these elements that we believe in a God who took on flesh and lived. That same God went to the cross to make payment for our sin, he died. He was buried in a tomb, but death could not hold him. For that God rose from the grave, conquering our last enemy. And as we share in this meal together, we are a people who believe the promise of our Lord that he will one day return and set all things right. Until that day, may we be filled by the very real presence of Jesus in this sacrament.
sing my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving ceases My comforter
Let us pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks for this holy meal. Give thanks for your presence at the table. Not just your presence, for this is your table and to it you have invited us. Lord, we are people who many times have sought to build our life on foundations that are anything but firm. And yet, with grace and mercy, you invite us to return to you again and again and again. To build our life on you. And so, Lord, we give thanks and ask that you would help us to do that. Flee from the temptation to build our life on, on what we own, on money, material things. Help us flee from the temptation to to order our life by our own plans, worrying when things aren't lining up like we hope that they would. Lord God, help us to build only on you. We give thanks not only for you, but for uh, your church here and around the world. That which gives us life and nourishes our faith. We pray for your church that you would strengthen it wherever it may be found. May we indeed be salt and light in this world as you call us to. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our city. Especially as, as the storm hits, we recognize in the papers day after day after day the desperation and the darkness the violence and the death, whether the stories have a name like Tyree Nichols or whether they are nameless people we hear, it seems almost every day, who have been murdered just up the street in Toledo. Lord God, would you come and make things right again? And would you use we, your people, filled with your life, whose lives are built on a firm foundation to hold out the hope of the gospel to this world in which we live. Lord, lead and speak to each one of us as you call us to be people giving ourselves to the mission you've given us in the world. It's with that mission in mind that we pray using the words that you taught us. We say together, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Continue to build that firm foundation that, that Clint, or that what, Gavin, you're not Gavin, <laughs> Landon, I'm sorry, that Landon preached about this morning was through our giving, giving joyfully and sacrificially in Jesus' name. And if you'd like to do that, you can do so at the place or in the back or on our website. But your generosity also helps us to do other things in the life of the church. And one of those is to provide ways for you to continue building your home your house, your life on a firm foundation of Christ. And we do that partly through small groups and also through individual study and spiritual reflection. And as we come to the season of Lent, which you can believe it, Ash Wednesday is coming up in just a couple weeks, we're going to have a way for you to uh, do, be participate in individual spiritual growth and also in group growth through this book, 40 Days with Jesus. You'll be seeing more details about this coming up. But as we start going through this book in the season of Lent, it's also given us an opportunity for new covenant groups to form. So if you are looking for a group of people to come together and kind of help build each other's house on the foundation of Christ, as we talked about this morning, come see me or or Stacy, and we'll look to get people together in that season. Before we leave today, let us sing of the great foundation, the firm foundation on which we stand. I encourage you to proclaim these truths as you sing them to one another. And I encourage you to declare them as a prayer also for your life today. Will you stand and sing, please?
Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. I hope you will linger and encourage one another, share fellowship and prayer downstairs. I hope you'll consider coming Wednesday night. We had a great week last week. We had so many people where we ran out of food. And so we uh, promised to make more food and there will be even more life. John Sluin uh, will not only be cooking, but then he'll be sharing the story about how Jesus uh, became the hero of his story. If you know anything about John, uh, you will be fascinated by that, I'm sure. And so we hope that you will join us at that time. Before we go, Landon, will you offer a blessing for all of us? Yes. As you leave, leave receiving this blessing. In James 1.22, James, it says this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. As you leave, leave confident that you have heard and know the word of God. And on that word, you have a firm foundation to build a life that will be a witness to others. Amen. Go in Christ. Amen.